ask that um, everybody can stand up as we enter this uh, time of worship.
Man, wow. Praise God. I'd go home right now. I'd just send you all home right now. We've done had church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wow. God bless you. Thank you for joining us at Heart of the Valley tonight. If you're with us for the very first time, we want to say thank you for joining us. Uh, if you'd remain standing, we go to the Lord uh, in prayer tonight. Um, 
I was just sitting and, and ruminating and, and kind of meditating this afternoon uh, on what the Lord would say tonight. And, and he would say, uh, Joshua 1 9, he says this uh, Moses had died, Joshua was coming up to take his place. He says, This is my command be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wherever your feet go, that place has to prosper. <laughs> that's the power that's within you and the resurrection power of the Lord, the Holy Spirit's impartation within you. I don't care if it's on your job or in your marriage or in your finances, your physical body, wherever it is. Victory is a mindset. Victory is a mindset and it's a matter of fact. It's not fictitious. It's a matter of fact. We don't fight from victory, folks. We, uh, we fight uh, for, from victory, not for victory. Okay? So is there anybody in this house that would dare trust God with your situation tonight? Would you just lift your hand to believe that God will show up and we be courageous and we're, we're going to stand strong before the Lord? We're building our house upon the rock, Christ Jesus. We're not foolish builders that are going to build on the sand. When the storms come and the waves crash in and the wind blows and that house goes away, we're going to build our house on the rock tonight with our faith, our mustard seed faith joined together. Father, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity. What a beautiful display of your glory tonight. What a beautiful display of courage tonight. What a beautiful display, Lord, of worship to you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, now we lift this up to you, these prayers, God, these needs, Lord. You said that we could cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us, Lord. You've gone before every situation, and you've planned it out ahead of time as your sovereign will would have it. And so, Lord, we trust you. Lord, whether you show up in it or not, you, we trust you, Lord. The outcome is yours. It belongs to you. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for marriages being restored. We thank you for addictions being crushed under the weight of your anointing. We thank you for physical bodies being brought back into order according to your original design in the name of Jesus. Father, we just thank you for our community. Father, in repentance, Lord, and just hungry and thirsting after you, God. And you said when we do that, we would be filled. So we thank you for that tonight. In Jesus' name, God bless you all. If you would turn around and just greet a few folks right there with, uh, within a, sh a close distance. The kids and the youth can be dismissed right now to go to their prospective classes. What's up, man? Let's go. Yeah, the youth and the kids, I was told they could, yeah, not them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys have to stay here. Yeah, thank you for being here. If we don't have your information or we, you need to update your information, this is the connection card that you would do that on. Uh, if you have that prayer that we prayed, a prayer request, you want us to continue to pray over that, please uh, fill that out. If there's an area of ministry that you're interested in, uh, this is the place where you would uh, let us know about that on that connection card. And then as the offering plates come by, you'll drop that off in there. Uh, we do baptisms here on the third Sunday of every month coming up uh, here pretty quick. If you would like uh, to be baptized, very significant part of your Christian walk, uh, please fill out this baptism certificate. Uh, drop it off in the offering plate as it comes by. Uh, we would love to partner with you in that and celebrate that with you. Uh, let the office know, first or second service. They'll contact you and get your shirt size and all of that. So uh, please fill that out if you're interested in being baptized here. Uh, Young at Heart, this on the 13th, Young at Heart is going to be meeting here at noon uh, for the potluck. Uh, I like the potluck part. I just don't know if I'm young at heart enough to show up. So I don't, I don't know. But uh, I can take a late lunch and just see what's up, you know. Hot luck, right? I don't know. Uh, youth winter camp. I, I don't know if there's a better display of where your resources could go 
than what you witnessed tonight for winter camp. Bring the kingdom. What is up? Can we give these young people a round? I mean, now that's $5 for every clap. That's, that's, that's five dollars for every clap now. That was at least two or three grand right there. All right, all right. So if you would like to help resource getting these young people up to bring the kingdom winter camp, uh, the information's out in the lobby table right there. Uh, you can help resource a young person to go, or you can give whatever amount the Lord would put on your heart to do that. Uh, literally going to change a young person's life for the glory of God. Amen. Your giving statements are also uh, out in the lobby if you need those for uh, tax purposes as well. So uh, with that being said, our ushers are going to come forward uh, tonight so you can uh, do what the Lord's called you to do and be a good steward of his resources. Amen. So we're going to pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. We honor you and we give you praise, Lord. We, we are so grateful Lord, that you would choose us to partner with you, God, to somehow expand your kingdom uh, here in the earth, Lord. And you said uh, your will be done uh, on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. There's no lack in heaven. And so, Lord, I pray that same thing here at Heart of the Valley and in the families that are represented here, Lord. Absolutely no lack in Jesus' name. And, Father, we thank you for hearts that are generous, Lord. And, and, and that's a mirror image of your heart, Lord. You're, you're a God that gives, Lord. Just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times throughout Scripture, uh, you, you talk about giving, how you gave, how you gave, how you gave over and over again. Lord, we're going to do the same tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for being here.
Amen. Wow. Can we give them another hand? Great job. You know, when, when I came in this evening, Johnny's like, hey, look, things, if anything can go wrong, it's been going wrong tonight. And I'm like, really? He says, yeah, you know, uh, Henry's sick, the backups are sick, and everybody's sick. And I'm like, am I singing today or two? Or, or? <laughs> because you do not want that. And so he said, no, the worship team from the youth group are going to take care of it. And man, they did, didn't they? Man. Well, has everybody been enjoying this, this study through the book of Revelation so far? Wow, it's kind of a crazy book, isn't it? But you know what? Sometimes when we look at the book of Revelations, it's always like futuristic. It's kind of like, yeah, someday, or yeah, this is going to come. Yeah, these are the things that are going to happen someday and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we're going to look at a few things. And I, I know Pastor Brian has been, uh, we've been, you know, at this stage, he's been going through the seven churches in Asia Minor and... Um, Today I'm going to talk about the last three, and I know that he talked about Sardis and Philadelphia, uh, but I'll, I'll just kind of touch on those as we roll into uh, taking a, a close look at uh, Laodicea. But I want us to think about something, because when we look at Revelations, we do think futuristic. We do think it's coming, it's things down the road. But I want you to also, when we look at these three churches, to kind of look at that and see which one you are. Because I I wanted to connect with you today that, not futuristic, now. Because each one of these churches represent a type of Christian. And, and, and when we look at them, I want you to think about what type of Christian you are. And so we're going to go through these. And uh, I was excited Pastor Brian asked me to uh, share because uh, right now he's suffering on the love boat. And having a hard time, and, and I say, hey, I'll, I'll step in and help out, no problem, you know, poor Pastor Brian. Um, but I was happy to do it. We've done this before, and this is exciting. So what I want us to do now first, the first church we're going to look at is the church in Sardis. Now, in Revelations chapter 3, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. If you want, read the screen behind me and or the outline in your hand and just kind of follow along. But in Revelations chapter 3, verse 1, let's take a look at this because it says, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, only Jesus has the seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit. In other words, the meaning is the complete, perfect spirit of God. That's Jesus. Now, in verse 2, look at this. It says, I know your deeds. Now, it's Interesting that all three of these churches that we look at, when he addresses each one, like he's doing this one in Sardis, he says those same four words, I know your deeds. How many agree God knows everything? There is nothing that he doesn't know about you. But I want us to just think about this as we go through this and evaluate your own life. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. The church in Sardis... Uh, was full of hypocrites. And they had a reputation, though, of being alive. But they are dead. And now, I want you to think about this. I, I've shared this with you once before. There was a, there was a painting contest, and these artists from, uh, uh, you know, all over came and gathered together, and the, they had this contest, and what they had to do is paint a picture of a dead church. And so they had all these renderings and all these... Uh, entries, and they narrowed it down to three. And so the, the first one you look at, it shows this preacher just up there just preaching his heart out, and the entire place is empty, and it's, it's just his wife sitting in there. And the artist is like, yeah, that's, that's a dead church. And then they go to the next uh, drawing, and it's this old, wretched-looking wooden building, the steeple's uh, cracked and the windows are cracked and the doors are hanging off the hinges and I mean just everything about it just said you know that's just a dead church and then the third one shows us this this uh, church the beautiful building the lobby is filled with people laughing and talking and fellowshipping with one another and I mean it just looked like a great place to be and so people were like I get the first two, but this one here doesn't make any sense because that looks alive. 
And under there, under the painting was this scripture here. I know you, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. You see, you can have a church that has nice buildings and all the programs and the bells and whistles and, and everything on the, 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 le the level of appearance. It just looks like it's got it going on. But it doesn't mean it's alive. And I think sometimes, church sometimes, we have to evaluate ourselves because it's not about just all those frilly things. Do you really know Jesus? Do, are you really walking with Christ? Or is it a social gathering? Is it just a crowd? Or is it a room filled with disciples? You see, the church in Sardis had a great reputation. But they're spiritually lifeless. And so on your outline, I want you to write this down. Sardis church was full of Pharisee Christians. Pharisees, you know Pharisees, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. They looked really good on the outside. They wear the nice robes and they have the cloak and, and they walk through the, uh, the community and everybody just kind of, woo, there's the Pharisees. And they, they loved all the attention and the respect that they got. from. I mean, everything about them, they looked spiritual, they looked holy, they looked righteous, but they were dead inside. Matter of fact, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. You look good and whitewashed and clean and everything looks wonderful on the outside, but inside, you're just nothing but dead bones. And I think this is the church that's being referenced here is like that. And maybe uh, we could ask ourselves, am I a Pharisee Christian? Do I, do I play the part, but I really don't, I'm really not a fully devoted follower of Christ. You know, do I know how to say the right things, do the right things, put a smile on, walk through the church door as though everything is wonderful? So what is Jesus' message to this church? Write this on your outline. Jesus' message, wake up and repent. Look what it says here in verse uh, 2 and 3. It says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. Now, to wake up means to start paying attention to your salvation. Focus on how you're living your life. Wake up and realize going through the motions just isn't good enough. Just saying the right things isn't good enough. God, but you know why that works? That works in, with me as far as you can fool me. We can fool one another. But again, as we read earlier, those four words, I know your deeds. We can't fool God. How many would agree that we cannot fool God? So it's all about a heart condition. And I've been doing ministry a, a lot, and I've just I've seen it over and over again. You think everybody in the church, or you think because you grew up in the church, you think because you, you proclaim and you speak, yeah, I'm a Christian. It, there, there, there's more than that because there's so many in these last days that are Christians in name only. And And... and and God was stirring this church up. He's saying, look, I see all this. You're dead. You have a reputation of being alive. You're doing all the right things and saying all the right things. You're going through the motions. But I know you. Therefore, I'm telling you, you're dead. And so maybe look at that and say, hey, where do I, am, am I in that realm of Christianity? And verse 4 says, yet you still have a few. And I think that's true as well. There's, always, there's still a remnant in the church that are fully devoted followers of Christ. Yet you still have a few in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. For they are worthy. That word worthy in that particular passage, what it means is something matching up. In other words, he's saying their faith that they proclaim from their lips matches the faith in their heart. Their actions and their deeds match what's in their heart. And so he's saying there's a remnant of those that are worthy. So here's the promise to this church. For those who wake up, write this down in your outline, is salvation. 
And verse 5, it says, he who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So Jesus is saying, stop acting like you have it all together and get it together. Get it? Okay, wow, you remember. That's good. I didn't know if you, I didn't know if I was going to have to retrain you guys. You're good, man. Okay, so just touching on that. I know Brian's already talked on this. And so uh, just bringing you up to speed. So the other church that we're going to look at real quick is the church in Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. And let's take a look at this and see if maybe this one's you. Now, the interesting about this church is it didn't receive any corrections. And all these churches, God's, or Jesus is pointing out some good things, but he's also pointing out some things that need to be corrected, some things that need to be changed. Not with the church in Philadelphia. Uh, take a look at this. Now, I want you to write this down. The Philadelphia church was full of faithful Christians. Maybe this one's you. Now, the message to this one, an open door of blessings. Now, I want us to take a look at verse 8 here. It says, I know your deeds. There it is again. I see I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, the open door, this, is an, this open door was a missionary blessing. A missionary blessing. Now, in verse 9, it says, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Now, faithfulness always leads to ministry opportunity. If those of you in ministry, it, it, it just be faithful in whatever it is that God's called you to do. Yeah, but I've been doing it for a while and I don't see any results. So what? It's not about results. Yeah, but we, we want to make a difference. Yes, I get that. But it's about faithfulness. When you stand before God one day, he's not going to pull out and see your success and your trophies and all of your things that, and all the accolades that go along with your life. He's going to look at you and say, well done, good, and what? That's all that matters. Hear me on this. That's all that matters is faithfulness. Because the increase is God's problem. He will bless it. He will use you. All he's looking for is people that are faithful and that have a faith in him and a trust in him and want to do great things. Now, when we look at the blessing, he's saying that, you know what, I'm going to bring people in. Those that are wicked and stuff, I'm going to bring them. He's, because if you're faithful, God's going to bring them to you. And God's going to bring the increase. God's going to change lives. Because he's going to always, always honor faithfulness. He can't help himself. If you're faithful, God's going to bless it. But it's not in the sense that we think of sometimes with the uh, name it, claim it, prosperity preachers that are like, doing, you know, a blessing is being getting rich or getting a Cadillac or getting a mansion or whatever. Uh, no, no, this is all about ministry and making a difference. So what's the, what's the promise to you from this church? Write this on your outline. To escape tribulation. You want to know what's good about being faithful? Look at this. Es escape tribulation. It says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming, that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Now, in that, that verse 10, I want you to think about this. It says here, since you have what? I need your help. Since you have my command and endured patiently, I will also... Here, now, let me just give you a truth. You can write this down in your outline here. Those who keep are kept. Simple truth. Those who keep are kept. In other words, those who keep true to the things of God and are faithful to the things of God, God's going to keep you. You're kept in the hand of God. Everything's going to work out with you. And so you need to understand and evaluate your life and hold on to those things that God has given you. Now, here's the truth. I mean, that's the truth I gave you. Now, in Sardis, it, it, it was the Pharisee Christians. Philadelphia is the faithful Christian. Maybe that's you. Now, again, I know this is futuristic. We talk about revelations. But I'm saying we, we can evaluate and look at this and say, hey, is that me? 
you know, is the very thing that he's addressing on his churches, is that, would that be me if he came here today? And if he was to address, address Heart of the Valley, if he was going to, what would he say? How would they uh, address that? Now, so just kind of bringing you up to speed. I know Pastor Brian shared on a, a lot of this. So now let's roll in to uh, the third church, and that is Laodicea in verses uh, 14 through 22. Now, Laodicea was, let me just tell you a little bit, give you a little background of this church in the, in the city of Laodicea. It, they were extremely wealthy. They, they had a ton of money. They, matter of fact, there was a massive earthquake. Now, we're going back to AD 17. And there was a massive earthquake. Buildings were broken down. I mean, the roads were destroyed. And so, but they were so wealthy and they had so much uh, independence and self-reliance that they said to the Roman government, we don't want your money. We, we, we can take care of ourselves. We don't need your money. And so that kind of gives you an idea. They, they were like an intersection city because the people going from the east and west, north and south would come through there. And, and it, there was trading going on. I mean, they just had a ton of money. Now just, now, just follow me on this. Three things that they were known for. Great wealth. They had a lot going on. The, uh, the, the, they're famous for their black wool. They would make cloaks. They'd make the, these rugs, uh, all kinds of linens, and, and, and make a, a ton of money on it. Matter of fact, Laodicea even had a, a medical school. And they, this particular medical school that Laodicea had uh, developed this ointment that, for healing of the eyes. Uh, and so this, this was a happening, thriving community, and the church there was affected by it. I guarantee it, because I want you to think about this. The, the Christians in Laodicea became very comfortable, very distracted by the wealth around them. This is why Jesus had a really issue a lot of times with riches, because it distracts. It, it, riches are, are, have, a, have a, a drawing power, and, and, and wealth does. Because if you get that you know, car, you're like, man, you know, a year after driving, I want to get the newest one. I got, I'm going to get the newest, you know. Uh, Apple Watch too, and I'm going to get, and we, we, you're never satisfied. You just want the newest thing, and because and, that's what riches, because riches don't satisfy. Understand that, and, and I'm not saying if you, you have an Apple Watch, you're going to hell, because I don't want you leaving here saying, hey, Pastor Brian, don't let him come, because he told me I'm going to hell. <laughs> really, why? Because I got an Apple Watch. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> now, 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 listen. It's a distraction. Wealth is a distraction. And, and we want more because it feeds the flesh. Now, let me just show you how this works. Because the Bible is very clear. It says, he that soweth to the flesh shall by the flesh reap life, what? Or destruction. He that soweth to the spirit shall by that spirit reap, what? Life everlasting. And so there is this contrast. There is this battle going on. We're going to feed one. And I always say, the one that's dominating you the most is the one that you're feeding the most. And if it's always about uh, the secular things and worldly things and possessions and money and wealth and, and popularity and power and privilege and, and pleasure and all those other words that start with P, it distracts you and, 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 and it has a drawing power. And the flesh wells up and says, man, this is good. It's called pride. Pride was affecting this church because they had it going on. Now, this church, on your outline, write this down. Maybe this is who you are as a Christian. The Laodicean church was full of lukewarm Christians. The Laodicean church has nothing to be praised for. The other churches, he praised. Jesus prayed, to, you know, hey, you got this issue, but hey, hey good job on that. The church in Laodicean, they, they, they received no praise. Jesus had a real problem with that. And here we go again. Those four words. I know your deeds. That you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. In other words, Jesus is saying to this church, you make me sick. You're lukewarm. And, and when I look at that, I used to always think that 
or I had a problem with that verse. And it was these words here. You are neither hot nor cold. And he says, I wish you were one or the other. And so we always look at that and we think, okay, hot, I'm on fire for Jesus. I'm on fire. If that's where he wants me. But then cold is like, man, I'm just living this cold, dark life, and, and I'm, I'm far from God, and there's a huge expanse between me and God. I'm not even right with God. I'm not even walking with God. That's how we used to look at that. At least I did. That either hot or cold. Now, but what bothered me was when he said, I'd rather you be hot or cold instead of being lukewarm. I'm like, okay, really? You want me to be cold? You want me to be distant from you? You want me to not even know you? You want me to walk uh, away from you? You want me to be a hell raiser? You just want me to go to hell rather than being lukewarm? At least, at least lukewarm, I'm halfway there. Right? I mean, at least I'm halfway there. That's average, isn't it? At least I'm average. How many would agree God's above average? God is above average. God hates average. Average is a sin. He says, you know, you look at, uh, you know, uh, you, have a, you commit adultery. Yeah, that's wrong. But I'll tell you what, uh, you just look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. You just raised the bar. I mean, it's like committing adultery. He's saying, oh, that's average. Look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed. The, 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 it's the sin of being average. Just doesn't work for God. Now, I want you to look, think about this because what he's referencing there and, and, and what he's trying to say is because where Laodicea was located, of course, there was Hierapolis and there was Ephesus. And so we had these two towns that were close near one another. And so when we look at these and, 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 and look at the our Colossae, so you had Herodias and then you had Colossae. Now, Colossae was known for its, its spring cold water, fresh water. The Hierapolis was known for their hot springs with healing minerals, and you can sit in them, and, 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 and the, the healing uh, minerals in these hot springs heal the body. Uh, but then in Colossae, it was these, these cold springs and, and river that were refreshed and renewed and rejuvenated. And so they would build these aqueducts that were underground to Laodicea, the, this water that would come from these. And by the time we got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. It was, it was just nasty. And the minerals from the hot springs, too. I mean, you, it was, it, you'd almost puke just drinking. They all knew this, and they all understood this. And Jesus is saying in that, hey, look, I would rather you be hot like the hot springs, the healing uh, minerals in that, and then that are helping people, or, the, or cold, like the, the cold springs that are refreshing, renewing. In other words, I'd rather have you one of those that make a difference in people's lives, to be new, lukewarm, and have no impact whatsoever. That's what's bothering him. Now, look, on your outline, put this down here. Lukewarm effect, no impact. This is where a lot of people are at, you know, if I can just be honest, because uh, George Barna or, um, did a survey, and the conclusion was that 66% of Christians are lukewarm. Now, lukewarm is just a nice way of saying casual Christian. And so when we're looking at this, this church in Laodicea that makes God want to puke, And I'm thinking about that, and I'm saying, you know, wait a minute. I don't, I, how many would agree that you, you can't work your way to heaven? You can't. You cannot work your way to heaven. There's nothing you can do to earn it where God can say, whoa, what are you doing here? Hey, well, I did this, 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 and this, so get out of the way. I'm in. That, that's not going to work. Okay, so let's just get that straight. Because I don't want you telling Pastor Brian, oh, Pastor Ken says you got to work your way to heaven. No, I'm not saying that. But listen to me. I think that when you are a believer, because here's the conflict. Paul is saying, you're, you're saved by grace. James is saying, you know what? You want to see my faith? Look at my works. This is, let me just kind of help you put those two pieces together. It's like someone is saying, oh, you want to be on, get on the boat called salvation? 
Yeah, it's free. Come on aboard. Everybody can ride for free. Nobody has to do anything to get on the boat of salvation. Oh, and by the way, now that you're on, why don't you straighten up the deck chairs? Clean the decks. In other words, God is saying, no, to get into heaven and to be on the team, you don't have to do anything. But now that you're on the team, let's work together to reach people and change lives. Do something. He cursed the fig tree, not because it was a tree. It was a tree. It provided shade. There was nothing wrong with it. But he cursed it because it was not bearing fruit. And we see that over and over again. And I think God says, okay, now you're a child of God. Do my business. Win the world. Change lives. Be a light in your community. Shine. The church in Laodicea wasn't shining. They were caught up in all the, the popularity and, and, and the wealth and, and just, you know, it, they were a crowd. But they weren't fully devoted followers of Christ. And so he's addressing this. And I think it's so powerful because I think sometimes we just think, well, you know what? I accepted Christ. I walked through the church doors, you know, on a Sunday morning, listened to a message and leave. I did my spiritual thing. Now I just go live my life any way I want. And, and God's saying, no, that's lukewarm. Now, Jesus calls the Laodicean church to repent of its sin. Now, look at this here. It says here, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. Now, what, what's he talking about? He's, he's addressing the three things I told you about them. They had tremendous wealth. They were known for their black wool, which made cloaks, carpets, and all that kind of stuff. They were known, known for their uh, medical school that created this ointment that healed the eyes. He dresses all three of those, but in a spiritual way. He's saying, look, I know you got a lot of money and you guys can do your own thing. But listen, I want you guys to realize something else. There's a different kind of riches, and it's found in me only. He says, buy from me gold refined in uh, the fire so you can become rich and white cloths, not the, the, all the linens and wool that you have, white cloths to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And a salve, here's the ointment, to put on your eyes so you can see. Now he's saying, here's the deal. I'm going to give you ointment so you can really see. That you would see the things of God. That you would see from a godly perspective. That you would see the spiritual things in life. And not just the natural. And he goes, I'm going to robe you in, a, in, in, in as white as snow. And you're going to be pure in my sight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you rich, but it's in eternal things. In the things of God. And he's saying, and so what he's doing, he's, he's like trading off. He says, you guys are so focused on the here and now, the natural things, and it's distracted you. It has drawn you away. And so where now you are totally ineffective, you have no impact whatsoever. You're not making a difference. And so th when we look at this, he's saying, I'd rather you be nice and cold where people can be refreshed and renewed because of your ministry. I'd rather you be hot, where people can sit in those the healing minerals of the hot spring, where you're healing people, making a difference. See, I'd rather you be effective, is what he's saying. Hot or cold, I want you to make an impact. I want you to change lives. Because you just being in the middle, you just being lukewarm, you're, you're ineffective, you're having no impact, and I wanted to spit you out. That is what we're looking at here in this church. And it's amazing. The, uh, th he's saying, I want you to shift from uh, material wealth to eternal wealth. Let go of the things of the world. How many would agree that the things of the world are real? Because I can see them. I feel them. And, 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 and it gets my attention. Anything that gets your attention. You know, I, I shared with you guys one time that if Satan can steer your heart, he can steer your life. And when you get, when something grabs your attention, all of a sudden you're looking at this shiny thing over here. And you go, that's neat. And you think about it. And then all of a sudden the, the heart starts moving that way. Because that's exactly what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean the Garden of Eden. Eve was just going about her business until Satan came along and said, hey, so you can't eat of any of the uh, fruit of the trees in the garden, huh? She said, no. We can eat the fruit in the garden. It's just that tree in the middle of the garden. We can't have that. Oh, we'll die. Oh, and here's Satan's word. You're not going to die. Really? 
He's working on it. He's trying to get her attention off of God and the things of God. And I want you to watch this because this is a powerful truth. He starts saying, yeah, but you know what? The reason why he doesn't want you to eat that, not that you're not going to die, is but because your eyes are going to be open and you will know the difference between good and evil. You will be like God. See, that's the biggest problem. We want to be God of our own lives. We want to call our shots. We want to uh, have all the things we want and do all the things we want to do. And so the Bible says that Eve began to look at the apple. Don't look. And then desire started to well up. And the Bible says that she looked at it. And it looked good to eat and desirable. Satan got her. He got her to look, then to dwell, and pretty soon desire. I don't care what it is. You look at something, think about something long enough, desires follow. And now her heart has been pointing to the apple, and it's no longer at that moment pointing at God. And she pursued the apple. Because you pursue whatever your heart is pointing at. And that's what the enemy wants to do. I've got to point their heart. I can tell them whatever I want, but that doesn't do anything. I've got to point their heart. I've got to create a desire. How many would agree desires are powerful? You know, you think about desires. I don't know. How do you illustrate a desire? I, it, it's like this. You ever taken like a small volleyball or, or a, a beach ball and you're in a swimming pool and you push it underwater? And the whole time it's wanting to come out, you feel the resistance. That, that's, desi- that's like a desire. It's just wanting it. It's just wanting out. And you get tired sometimes. You, you kind of uh, let go a little bit, ease up, and the thing fi- flies out of the water. Boom, into action. Because we're always fighting desires. The enemy knows the only way I can move you is to create a desire that points your heart towards other things. And the church of Laodicea's heart was pointing at wealth. It was pointing at uh, the, 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 you know, the things that uh, they, the, the linens and all the money they're making off of that and, and this, the, all the different things that that city had to um, offer, all the pleasures of life at their fingertips. And the thing about this church, they were self-reliant. Rome, we don't need you. Whenever you become self-reliant to the point where you're like, God, I don't need you. I can make my own path. I can do my own thing. I'm in charge. I can do it. I can make my own way. I don't need no help. And pretty soon, it was like, yeah, be your own God. Yeah, you don't need God. Yeah, do your own thing. Yeah, you're in charge. You're large and in charge. Nobody else can tell you what to do. You got it all together. And pretty soon, we start drifting from God. And I think so often, we don't realize that the distractions of life Is it sin? You think the wealth and all these things? No. Money's just, that's not sin, but the love of money is. And that's a desire. I want that. And that becomes my source more than God. The church of Laodicean was a church that was saying, hey, we, got, we can do our own thing. And the problem is when we get to that point, we are literally ineffective for the kingdom of God. They had no impact. There was nothing good to say about them. Jesus had something good to say about all the other churches. And there was some correction, except the church in Philadelphia. They, they, were, they were faithful. But this church, there was nothing good to say. And that's the whole point of all this, is that when we... If we become a lukewarm Christian, we have no impact. We can't change anything. This is all about me. And, and, and that's where the enemy wants to put us, to that point where we're pursuing those things. It's, it's like I think I've shared with you before, that compass that Jack Sparrow had in the Pirates of the Caribbean. It always pointed what he desired. It didn't work. But it, it pointed to whatever he desired. He was trying to find the black pearl, and that was the desire of his heart. That compass would point him the way to where he could find it. It's the same thing with us. 
The thing that we desire, it points our heart, and pretty soon it, we're pursuing these things. And that's why it's, it's, it's vitally important that Jesus said this. Now, this, I want you to get this. He said, daily, daily, you've got to take up your cross, deny yourself, and now follow me. You're not going to do the last thing until the first two things are done. That's the point. He's saying daily you need to deny yourself. It's not about you. You're not God. Paul said daily I die. Take up that cross of sacrifice. And then Jesus says, you know what? Now you're ready. Let's go. When you think about the rich young ruler, what was the very reason why he got up and turned his back on Jesus? His wealth. He was distracted. That was his God. Jesus said, go sell everything and come follow me. This guy could have been a disciple. Whenever he said, come follow me, he's making you a disciple. And he turned his back on Jesus. And the Bible says, because he had great wealth, it was a distraction and it had his heart. His heart was pointing at his treasures. And we need to understand that the greatest treasure of all is Jesus. Now, the message that Jesus had was this, and your outline, write this, repent and let me in. Now, Revelations 3, 19 and 20, this is the last uh, scripture, it says this, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will open it and eat with him and he with me. Now, when we used to, I mean, that scripture has been used for years. You know, Jesus just standing at the door knocking. You need to let him in. And we're always thinking about the unbelievers. We're always thinking about the lost. Jesus is let him in. This is to the church. The church of Laodicea, Jesus wasn't in that church. He was on the outside of that church. And he's saying, hey, guys. I know you're self-reliant. I know you got it all together, and, and you're doing your own thing, but I'm just telling you, I'm out here, and I'm knocking. Why don't you let me back in? Let me be Lord again. Let me be the most important thing in your life again. Let me be your Savior. That's what it's saying here. I'm standing at the door, and this is, uh, now, just, now just take it down to an individual level. You. You can be a Christian in Jesus on the outside. I know that sounds impossible. But it's what they were. They're going through the motions. And we can go through the motions, and pretty soon we're not even talking to God unless there's a crisis. We're not even spending time in the, in the, in the Bible. As a matter of fact, we're like, I don't even know where my Bible is right now. Uh, it, 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 that's going to come to roost someday. All this is going to come. He's going to say, look, you're either a Pharisee Christian, you're either a faithful Christian, or you're a lukewarm Christian. And that's what we're learning in this. And that's the whole point of all this. And Jesus is addressing in Revelations the conditions of these churches. You know, and, and I think sometimes these are seasons, like even in the modern day, what, ch what, what church are we at? Where are we at in these last days? And we see in so many churches, the, the, have you ever seen this? I mean, a lot of these, like the mega churches that are 5,000, 10,000. That's just a massive crowd. How do you disciple that? How, how do you know that you got two five thousand people showing up on a Sunday morning, and you're like, uh, yeah, they're all just fully devoted followers of Christ. They love Jesus. How do you know? How do you even measure that? I mean, that's just massive. And and I and I think it's it's setting up, and we're going to see a lot of churches like this because that's just too big to disciple them, to to, to hold them accountable, to challenge them, to push them to grow, and and to get involved in their lives. And people, they just come in, sing, clap, boom, hear a message, and gone. And, and you wonder where their faith really is. Because here's the thing. Is the worship team, if they're around, I don't even know if they're coming back. They're playing their youth program. But I, don't even know, I may have to close in song, guys. Okay? I may have to sing. That will get you out of here. So that's a good thing. Now, now, now listen. This. You think about this. Because somewhere in Scripture, it just, just blows my mind. Because it's like, some of you will say, I prophesied in your name. Matter of fact, I cast out demons in your name. And Jesus is going to say, yeah, but I never knew you. That's really, that, that's scary. Because these people were obviously 
involved in ministry to some degree. I mean, you're, you're, you're prophesying, you're casting out demons, there's, there's an element of faith there, there's something going on there, but Jesus is saying, yeah, you did those church things, but I never knew you. And that rich young ruler that I told you about, when he ran and felt at the feet of Jesus, he said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, well, okay, obey your parents. He started naming off Ten Commandments. And the rich young ruler said, yeah, I've been, I, I've been doing that since I'm a little boy. So when, when you look at that, I'm thinking, okay, he's, he was religious. He, he knew uh, the Ten Commandments and, and following, and thou shall love your neighbor and all that stuff. And he's like, yeah, I've been doing that since I was a little boy. So he, he was religious. But he still turned his back on Jesus. So we can't even trust ourselves, is what I'm saying. We have to just cling on to Jesus. We have to push through the crowd. Like the woman that was subject to bleeding, just push through the crowd, grab hold of Jesus. And hang on. And pray. And spend time in his word. And let him begin to move and change your life. That is the key. Let me just tell you this. This is the key in spiritual growth. you got to spend time in the word. You, you got, yeah, I know, but I read the word. It's kind of boring. And it's like, I don't get it all. And it's just like, I don't know. I, uh, read the word. Let me tell you why. Because it's, it's, Peter says it's the living and enduring word of God. It's alive. I don't know how it works. Just read it. And it starts changing you. you, you it, it, we try to do all the work. We try to do that. We're like, I'm trying to understand this. Okay, I'm going to apply that to my life. Yeah, that's, and it'll just start happening. Just read the word of God. And, you know, just go and get in the New Testament and the Gospels. Just start there and, 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 and read and study the life of Jesus, and all of a sudden, it starts speaking to you. Just don't do anything. Just read it. And just, and, and, and you go, oh, I didn't see that before. Oh, that's neat. And then it start applying it to your life. Because if you're just knowing the word of God, and that's why usually when I speak, I say I only want to do two things. I want you to know something, and then I want you to do something. Because if you don't do the word and live the word, it's meaningless. It's just information. And so what I'm saying is that we have to be more vigilant and intentional in our walk with the Lord. We have to spend time in prayer. We have to spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in the Word. That's your life. Well, no, it's not my life. It's a side thing. I, you know, I, I, I got my job. And I got my friends. I got my hobbies. I got all this fun stuff. I do church. I got, God gets a sliver. He, God's, God's the hub. And he feeds everything else. And so I'm challenging you tonight. We don't want to be a lukewarm Christian. We don't want to be like the, the church in Sardis that had the reputation of being alive and everything was wonderful. And, 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 but yet they were dead inside. We want to be like the church in Philadelphia that was full of faith. And that takes effort. And, and just keep pursuing. And your faith will grow. Your love for God will grow. Your desire, because what, what, what you're doing when you're spending time in the Word, spending time in prayer, time in the Word, time in prayer, it starts to do something in here. It starts to create a desire. And that desire is Jesus. You just want more of Jesus. You want to honor Jesus. You want to live in a way that brings glory to Him. It's not about me anymore. I'm going to step off the pedestal. I'm, not going to, I'm getting off the throne. I'm no longer God. I want Him to be God, and I'm going to live for Him. And, 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 and it's with desire, not out of discipline and self-will, like, okay, I'm going to start doing these things for Jesus because I'm supposed to. No, and he's like, dude, I don't even want any of that. But like I said, desire is like wind in a cell. It moves us. It's just easy when you desire to do something to do it. And so what I'm saying is do those things, be in church, and, 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 and get involved in ministry, and watch the desire for the things of God to grow naturally because you're feeding it. And when you feed something, it grows. And like I said, how do I know uh, which is stronger, the flesh or the spirit? The one that you're feeding the most. Get it? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you have taught us tonight, Lord. God, we examine our hearts tonight. Lord, we look inward and we examine ourselves. And Lord, we, we don't want to be a Pharisee Christian. We don't want to be a hypocrite. We don't want to have the reputation of being alive, but yet really inside we're dead. Lord, we don't want to be 
Lord, a lukewarm Christian? Where we're just going through the motions and there's just no passion in it, there's no desire, there's no heart. It's just intellectual faith. Lord, we want to be a faithful Christian. We want to be like the church in Philadelphia that, that was doing great exploits for the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, I pray that you draw each and every one of us closer to you. Lord, may your Holy Spirit begin to uh, seed and ignite a desire within our hearts to know you, to truly know you and to serve you and to walk with you. And, Lord, may that give us victory over the other areas of our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for that, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Let me, um, real quick, before we dismiss, I want to just give you guys just a, just a little bit. I'm not even going to charge you. Okay? This is free. Some people have come to me and they say, you know what? I got this problem, this addiction, uh, and I got this weak area in my life, and this weak area, and this sin, and this thing. And, and we're like, you know, okay, you got to get in counseling. I've gotta, I'm going to read this 12 step book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all that. And all that stuff's good. It's all additives. It's just anything that helps you stay on the course, I'm all for it. The greatest thing you can do is what I mentioned earlier, grab hold of Jesus. Because he, that's what changed. He's one, see, the whole goal in that is to put new desires to where you want to do the things of God. And there's just something about when you're, when you're filled up with the Spirit and it's strong that those other things begin to start falling off because they can't live there. And you just keep pursuing, and God began to do a work from the inside out. And, and you'll see that, that God's always faithful. And that you just push towards him and allow him to just grow in your, in your faith. Because it's a process. It's a, it's a growing process. Even in the natural, you're the kid, you just feed them, and it just takes time. They just keep growing because you're feeding them. Keep feeding the spirit, and I promise you it will keep growing. And, and then the, when, as it grows, the desire for the things of God grows. It's not an overnight thing. I know we typically, we want to take a pill. We just want a fast fix. But it, 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 it's, it's really just a, a decision. You know what? I'm giving Jesus my life. I'm giving him my habits. I'm giving him my hangups. I'm giving him all the hurts. I'm going to give him all the problems. I'm going to give him all the ugly and the warts and all. And watch what he does. And just stay true. Have Get some support base. Get people to hold you accountable and stay, hang in there. Amen? Amen? Hey, well, I don't think the worship team's coming back. So give me a... Uh, all right, here I... Huh? Oh, there you are. Hey, really? Why you guys keep me hanging? Hey, let's stand up. Let these young people lead us in some worship. They do a great job. Amen. Amen.
you are dismissed. <laughs>